today we're going to talk about two very important philosophers of science of the 20th century, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn. Uh, but before we do, we need to explain a little bit of the background that first Popper and then Kuhn uh, are reacting against, the sort of um, view of science that was implicit in some of the thinking of the logical positivists, which, as you recall, logical positivism was a movement that was a huge fan of science, that basically said that science was, was what was doing the real work of finding out about the world, and philosophy, while it had a role, all, all its job was, was uh, basically talking about truisms, things that are true by definition, whereas science was doing the real empirical work. So they were kind of science fanboys, and uh, they ha but they had this view of science uh, that was related to the um, the verification theory of meaning as well. The, this idea uh, that uh, theories can be verified through observation. So I'm going to introduce that. Uh, one name for that view of science is inductivism. Uh, the reason will become clear in a minute. Then I'll uh, talk about how Papa is a response to that, and then how Kuhn is a response to both of them. Uh, everything I'm saying is basically taken from what I think is one of the best books, philosophy introduction books ever written. It's called What Is This Thing Called Science? And it's by a guy called Alan Chalmers. Uh, and I recommend wholeheartedly reading it. It's in at least its fourth edition, and it's just incredibly clearly written with tons of great examples taken from history of science. He's a historian of science, and it just does uh, a really wonderful job of um, explaining all this stuff. Okay, so let's start with inductivism. Um, inductivism is the idea that we can learn from the observable facts. And, uh, well, let's put it this way. We start from observation. Observation gives us a set of facts. So we observe the world, we observe certain phenomena, and then from repetitive observation of the world, we derive general laws and theories. Uh, so, you know, the picture of Newton having an apple fall on his head, uh, this is one example of an observation, and then combined with all the observations of things falling, uh, you know, studying the, the, uh, how they fall, the acceleration or whatever, you derive uh, laws that are general. So from particular observations, uh, repeated enough times, you say, okay, I've seen this fall in this circumstance, and this other thing fall in this circumstance, and this other thing fall in this circumstances, and they all fall, fell in the same way, so I'm going to derive a general law of motion from that. Uh, and once you establish laws and theories, uh, this is the, perhaps the greatest product that science gives us, these laws and theories, because what they enable us to do is make predictions and make explanations. Predictions help us manipulate the world. They, uh, from a general law and theory, you can derive a specific prediction about something that will happen. You know, from my, observa so it, from my observation of how things behave, have behaved on particular instances in the past, I have derived a general principle, and from this general principle, I can derive a prediction about what uh, the way a particular thing will happen in the future. So how is it that, uh, for example, NASA is able to send a probe that encounters a comet, which is basically like uh, hitting a bullet with another bullet? How is it that NASA is, in, is able to do this? Well, it's because we understand the laws that govern the motion of all um, objects, including the comet, and we can predict where the comet will be by the time that uh, a, a probe 
will arrive there and we make sure that uh, they coincide at a point and we're able to send a probe to the comet. So the prediction is the comet will be at this point in the future, so we make sure that's where the probe is, and it's successful. So we are able to see that this whole process is, a, is true. We have derived, in other words, our laws describing the world are true of the way that the world operates. So there are a bunch of assumptions behind this picture of science, which is a very um, positive view. Basically, it, it views science as uh, the pro it has this view of the progress of science from primitive science to sophisticated science, and we're just steadily move getting better and better and better and better. Primitive science gets a few things right. Uh, then we improve a bit, then we improve a bit, and until ideally, eventually, we will get a complete science which describes everything correctly. The theories are completely true and explain uh, the world fully. That's sort of the, the gold standard. Now maybe, you know, humans won't exist long enough as a species to arrive at this complete science, but we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer and every Every new theory is better than the one before because it's better confirmed. So, what are the assumptions behind this? Well, one, that uh, we have access to the facts, that there are these things called observation statements. We saw this even in um, Quine, uh, because some of the things Quine says are fairly radical, but in this respect, he is uh, a bit old-fashioned. He's very much influenced by the, the logical positivists. There's this idea that, um, if you remember, Quine had this view of the world, and our theory sort of impinges on the world like an upturned bowl. And at the edge of the bowl, it does make contact with the world, and the edge of the bowl is these observation statements. This is where uh, the basic raw material that science has to explain. These are the facts. What science has to do is explain those facts. But what this assumes is that we can correctly describe the facts, uh, independent of any theory. So the facts, our description of the facts is uh, theory neutral. It's just reality. We describe reality and then once we've described reality, we derive a theory from our description of, uh, of reality. So, um, uh, you know, a very simple example, you know, we get a thermometer, we measure the boiling point of water on one occasion, it comes out to 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, so we say this sample of water boiled at 100 degrees centigrade, let's say. Now, even putting it that way, there's a lot of theory involved, uh, and we'll get to that in a second, but imagine that's an objective description of the facts. Does that prove that all water everywhere in the universe boil has the same boiling point? Well, obviously not, um, but the idea of inductivism is if the more we do it, the better confirmed it is. So, for example, the difference between there is a law that water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, but there's not a law that every time I forget my umbrella, it rains. Even though, you know, suppose that happens on a couple of occasions. Maybe it happens every day in a week. I forget my umbrella and it rains. So you could say those are objective observations. I forgot my um umbrella and it rained. Uh, does that prove that there's a legitimate law that every time I forget my umbrella, it rains? Well, no, because we haven't done enough. We haven't done enough observations to confirm that general law. Whereas there have been millions of measurements of boiling water and they've all confirmed it. So the more observations we do, the more that, that match the general law, the more confirmed it is. So what, one of the things that science does is it confirms laws by doing experiments. And so uh, those laws are more and more confirmed the more, um, the more experiments we do. However, 
going back to the idea, uh, the problem for this is that actually this idea that we can have theory neutral observations appears to be just a fiction. Because, for example, uh, just to look at my simple example of measuring the boiling point of water, how do you measure it? You use a thermometer. Wait a minute. How do you know a thermometer accurately records the temperature? How do they build thermometers? You know, I'm talking about the old-fashioned kind that contain mercury. Yeah. When I was a kid, uh, we had fun in science classes by breaking thermometers and playing with the mercury because it, it moves around in a little bubble. It's a miracle I'm still alive. But, you know, nowadays you don't have those. But in, in the old days you had them and they had mercury in them. And, you know, there's little markings on the side of the glass tube that tell you the temperature. But how do we know they got it right? Well, because they used other thermometers to measure the temperature at which um, the, the uh, mercury reached a certain height. And then they marked, OK, at, at 100 degrees centigrade, the mercury is at this height. So we'll mark 100 degrees centigrade on the thermometer uh, next to where the mercury is when it's in this water, which we know is at 100 degrees centigrade. But how do you know it's 100 degrees centigrade? By using a thermometer. How did you design that thermometer? You can see it's kind of a regress. There's always going to be, um, at some level, uh, theory involved in your observation. There is literally no such thing as a, uh, a theory-free observation. Now, Quine has things to say about this, but we, we don't have to get into that. However, and you could, uh, uh, someone like an inductivist is going to argue, well, but there's degrees of theory ladenness, and you can have comparatively theory, uh, uh, you know, theory-free observation. The gold standard presumably would be observation by the naked eye, as opposed to observation using instruments like thermometers or telescopes, which are built according to some theory and testing according to some theory. But if you just use, you know, a naked eye. But uh, even then, um, there's a theory built into the very way you describe something. By describing something as red, you are uh, involving a conceptual scheme that you yourself have that you don't know is necessarily shared by everybody else. Okay, so there is that problem. So it's not as if the facts, you start with bare facts and then you derive the theories from the bare facts. You can't get bare facts without theories. So this picture of facts first and then theories is misrepresents what's really going on. The other uh, serious problem with this is a problem that was first noted by the great Scottish philosopher David Hume, which is the problem of induction. And the problem of induction is that, in fact, um, this idea of confirmation is just uh, rationally unjustified. And this is nicely illustrated. The problem of induction is uh, induction is this process where supposedly particular instances of some occasion uh, steadily confirm um, a general law. So in other words, a general law is not really confirmed at all if you have just one observation, like me going out of, uh, outside without my umbrella. But if you have millions of observations, then it's strongly confirmed. So in other words, there's degrees of confirmation, and the more observations that you have, uh, that appear to be consistent with the general law, the more particular observations that you have that appear to be consistent with the general law, the more well confirmed it seems to be. However, um, it is just not the case that any amount of particular observations logically imply a general claim. Uh, a valid argument, which is a deductive argument, that succeeds is when the premises guarantee the conclusion. But no particular premises can ever guarantee a, a general conclusion, because a general conclusion applies to a literal infinity of cases. You know, you're saying anything that is water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. 
that would be anywhere in the universe in which it occurs. So um, you can never say that you have proved a general law on the basis of particular observations. Bertrand Russell gives a, a, a well-known illustration of this. He says, uh, imagine a turkey who associates a bell ringing with getting fed. So uh, the farmer always rings the bell, uh, every t and the turkey, when it hears the bell, knows that it will get fed, because every time it's heard the bell ring, it gets fed. And if it is a good inductivist um, turkey, every time this happens, it has a better reason to believe that bell ringing means feeding, because every instance is confirmation, and the more, more it hears, the more it gets uh, fed. But of course, what the turkey doesn't know is that it's being fat fattened up for Thanksgiving. So actually, the more the bell rings, the closer it gets to the turkey, the bell ringing actually meaning death for the turkey. So just as it's, got, it's decided, well, bell ringing is an absolute 100% sure-fired indication of food, the farmer rings the bell, the turkey comes running, and it gets slaughtered. Uh, uh, another example of this, um, it's sort of a joke. Uh, a guy jumps off the um, top floor of a skyscraper, and every, uh, people hear him say, as he passes every floor on the way, way down, so far, so good. In other words, what he's thinking is, every time I fall past a floor and su survive, that is confirmation of the fact that falling past a floor leads to survival. So by the time I've fallen past 100 floors, I'm absolutely certain that falling past a floor leads to survival. But of course, sadly, that's not true. So um, there is this problem of induction. That induction, induction doesn't even make uh, a general claim more likely because the amount of confirmation that any a uh, finite number of observations can give to a general law which applies to an infinity of cases is, uh, is um, infinity divided, well, which way around is it? But basically it leads to zero. The uh, amount of confirmation uh, that any finite number can, um, can give to an infinite, uh, a law that applies to infinity of cases is effectively zero. This is the puzzle of induction, and philosophers have worked on this ever since. Now, what can you say about this? Well, Popper's uh, solution was to say, science, this picture of science is wrong. This picture that says that science starts with the facts and progresses steadily by confirming uh, general laws inductively is just mistaken. Um, and a title of one of his books makes clear his picture. It was called Conjectures and Refutations. Um, or another way, another label for this view of science is Guess and Test. So what f the first point he makes is that induction faces the problem of induction, that uh, it, it's just not the case that any number of particular observations effectively confirm anything. So instead of confirming uh, general laws, we should flip it on its head and we should falsify them. So instead of starting with the facts and deriving from them general laws, what we do is we conjecture a set of laws, a theory, a hypothesis about the world. Now where does this theory come from? It doesn't come from the facts. We just make it up. Any theory, uh, any particular source for a theory is allowable. It doesn't matter where you get the theory from because you may not hold on to this theory long. The only thing that must be true of this theory is that it is falsifiable. And you should only believe the theory if you have tested it. Obviously, if you've tested it and it's failed the test, then you shouldn't believe the theory. You should discard the theory. But the only way you should uh, believe a theory is if, according to the theory, certain things are predicted. You test to see if the prediction comes true. And if the prediction does come true, then the theory has survived a test. And you can tentatively believe it. However, 
We never assume that the theory is true. We just assume that the theory hasn't been proven false. Does this mean it's a correct view of the world? Popper is, uh, is agnostic on that. We just know that it hasn't been proven false. We don't assume we've got a... We never, in fact, assume that our scientific theory is a true picture of the world. We just assume that it works. So it's a very pragmatic view of science. Uh, now, the logical point. Falsification is deductive. The problem with induction is it derives general laws from particular claims, and you can't do that because you can't, no amount of particular observations can um, prove a general claim. But the, a, a general claim can be disproved by a single observation. Uh, the classic example is uh, Europeans used to believe that all swans are white, then they arrive in Australia, they see black swans. How many black swans do they need to see to know that all swans are white is false? And the answer is just one. So just one observation can, can uh, conclusively refute a general claim. So instead of trying to confirm general claims, we should try to falsify them. And that doesn't face the problem of induction because it's deductive. Uh, you know, uh, all, swans, um, all swans are white is con inconsistent with even one swan not being white. The other great thing about uh, Popper's idea of falsificationism is that it appears to provide a, a very nice uh, demarcation between science and pseudoscience. That is, uh, Popper answers the question, what makes something scientific? And his answer is falsifiability. Uh, and Popper railed against theories that claim to be scientific, but he claimed, but he said we're not. So for example, classic examples were uh, Marxist um, theory of history, uh, dialectical materialism, and um, the uh, um, Freudian psychology is another one. Freudian psychology is supposed to be scientific, it's presented as scientific, uh, but what the problem with both Marx's theory of history and Freudian psychology uh, is that the predictions they make are consistent with competing views, with competing, uh, I'm sorry, contradictory circumstances. So here's a good example from um, page uh, 39 in, um, is it 39 or no, 59? in uh, what is this thing called science, uh, applying it to Adlerian psychology. A fundamental tenet of Adler's theory is that human actions are motivated by feelings of inferiority of some kind. In our caricature, that is, it's you know, kind of a sketch of the theory, this is supposed by the following incident. A man is standing on the bank of a treacherous river. At the instant, a child falls into the river nearby. The man will either leap into the river in an attempt to save the child, or he will not. Now, uh, if, a theory, if Adler's theory is, is uh, scientific by Popper's standards, it will make a prediction such that if the prediction does not come true, it is falsified. The trouble with Adlerian psychology is it makes itself consistent with either possibility. Uh, so, um, if he does leap in, the Adlerian um, responds by indicating how this supports his theory. The man obviously needed to overcome his feelings of inferiority by demonstrating that he was brave enough to leap into the river, in spite of the danger. If the man does not leap in, the Adlerian can again claim support for his theory. The man was overcoming his feelings of inferiority by demonstrating that he had the strength of will to remain on the bank, unperturbed while the child drowned. So this is a clear indication that Adlerian psychology in our caricature is unfalsifiable because nothing counts as disproof. Now, uh, 
this might be presented as a strength of Adlerian psychology. We can explain anything. But what Popper convincingly argues is that in fact it's a weakness, because if you can explain everything, then you explain nothing. You have to say that this will happen and this won't happen for your theory to be falsifiable. Now that doesn't mean it's true. Being falsifiable doesn't mean you're true. In fact, we never know if uh, a theory is true or not, but it means that it is testable. And science, so in order to possibly qualify as a scientific theory, you have to be falsifiable. In order to, uh, to qualify as a, a, a good scientific theory, it has to be falsifiable and have survived falsification. That is, it made a prediction and it was right. Um, now, there are, there are degrees of falsifiability. So you can say something is more scientific. You can have, uh, so instead of just saying it's either non-scientific or scientific, you can have, well, more and more scientific, the more falsifiable it is. Um, and initially, Popper talked about falsifiers. The, uh, the more scientific a theory is, the more falsifiers it will have, the more opportunities to be falsified. Um, and this also presents a view of how science progresses. The inductivist view of science is that it's a smooth progression, learning more and more stuff. We, le we, we did know uh, stuff at the, at the beginning in simple science. We knew simple predictions, and, we, and those are still true. We just learn more truth. It's, it's like we got a big box and we, uh, uh, of truths, and we contribute more and more to that throughout the history of science. On the Popperian view, um, you make progress by having a big bucket of falsified theories. So these aren't theories you ever look at. Unlike our box of truths that, that are all useful, according to this picture, uh, we have a, a trash heap of disposed of theories. And you make progress by a problem occurring for a theory, or a problem occurring, and then a conjecture is made about a theory that will explain this. Um, and the, there's a good uh, description of this involving bats. Uh, suppose we are bewildered by bats. You know, this is back in, in the early days. We start with a problem. Bats are able to fly with ease and at speed, avoiding the branches of trees, telegraph wires, other bats, and catch insects. And yet bats have weak eyes uh, and are flying at night. This poses a problem because it apparently falsifies the plausible theory that animals like humans see with their eyes. So we have this theory that appears to be falsified. So how do we progress? Well, we uh, conjecture about, um, well, first of all, we conjecture that the bats are somehow seeing. And the way to test that is to blindfold them and see if they can see. And it turns out that our, our conjecture is falsified because when blindfolded, the bats fly. It's adorable, little bats with tiny little blindfolds. Um, the ba bats continue to fly perfectly. So we've we falsified a conjecture. So now we've got a problem. So we come up with a new conjecture. How do we come up with it? Who knows? An apple falls on our heads. Again, Popper says you can come up with a conjecture through any way. The, the, the way you come up from your, with your conjecture is immaterial. It's just that you have a conjecture that's testable. And then, you know, you plug your ears. The, you make a new conjecture that somehow it's through hearing. And you plug their ears, and they run into things, and it's uh, it survives falsification. And this view seems to explain the history of scientific growth from the Aristotelian view of the universe through the Newtonian view of the universe to the Einsteinian one. At uh, each point in the transition, they faced problems that they could no longer solve. The new theory was a new conjecture that suggested a way to solve it, and it solved it. Uh, so seems like a very plausible picture of science, certainly more plausible than this one. Now, there is a problem with this picture, which is a problem of quantifying falsifiability. 
Um, how do you count the number of falsifiers that uh, a theory has? Um, and it just seems that if you're asked to come up with a specific number uh, of instances of qualification, that it will always turn out to be potentially infinite. So if we have to give an objective score of how falsifiable each theory is, we're going to we're going to meet with a problem. So uh, what um, Chalmers calls sophisticated falsifiability slightly shifts this focus. It doesn't say, uh, when it's talking about degree of falsifiability, it, it turns it from objective uh, degree of falsifiability that each, like a, an, a, a score that each theory would have, to relative falsifiability. That is, when you're saying how falsifiable a theory is, it's always in comparison with some other one. So, for example, uh, the example in the book is Newton's theory is more falsifiable than Kepler's because Kepler's theory was just about heavenly bodies, whereas Newton's theory applied to all matter in the universe. So, obviously, more instances of observation would falsify Newton's theory than would falsify Kepler's. So that makes Newton's theory more falsifiable and therefore better. Um, the other thing that sophisticated, the other advanced sophisticated falsifiability is, is it comes up with a conception of confirmation to replace um, the, uh, the inductivist view of confirmation. Because the, the other problem with the there's a problem with this idea of, um, of guess and test. It seems a little bit too anarchic, because if anybody's allowed to come up with any conjecture at any point, then this will sort of, science will be scattered in all directions of just individuals saying, I've got a theory, I'm going to test it. I've got a theory, I'm going to test it. Uh, and there's no way to really say uh, that a theory is good. You know, it's just, has it survived a test? Well, okay, then it's provisionally, it's provisionally worth hanging on to. But you, there, uh, in the basic falsification picture, there isn't really degrees of confirmation. You can't say, well, well, we shouldn't be diverting attention on this wacky theory because we've got this well-confirmed theory. How do you come up with a, a, a conception of confirmation in the falsification picture? Well, um, there's this distinction between uh, one, of, one of the downsides to the inductivist view is it seems to suggest that every scientist, every kid boiling water for the first time, their observation of water boiling is just as valuable in the degree of confirmation that it gives to the, the law that water boils at 100 degrees centigrade as any other one. So, you know, the first person who boils water to uh, a, a kid doing it as their first science experiment in school, each one is on a par. Whereas what Popper uh, uh, pointed out is that that's not the case, that um, the value there are differing values of uh, potentially the same observation depending on the background knowledge. So, a confirm a, a when you uh, a theory fails to be falsified, um, this is valuable when the theory was bold relative to the background knowledge. So, in other words, the boldness of your conjecture is important. Um, because if your conjecture is entirely consistent with everything that science says at the time, then if it survives the test, that's no big deal. That's not a big degree of confirmation. Whereas if you make a bold test, like famously um, the, uh, the prediction that light would bend in a gravitational field, uh, that confirmed Einstein's view and uh, thereby, dis thereby falsified Newton's view, um, it was a bold prediction of Einstein's theory because it was inconsistent with Newtonian uh, science, which had dominated for centuries. 
So th when it is tested and it passes the test, then that counts as a really big degree of confirmation. So, and also, uh, a really important falsification is of well-accepted theory. A falsification of a wacky theory, like, you know, every, uh, my, my carrying an umbrella affects the weather, if that's falsified, I remember my umbrella and it still rains, that's no great advance in science because it was a wacky theory. It was, so refutations of bold conjectures are not valuable. Refutations of apparently well accepted conjectures are very valuable. That's the sign of real progress, like when uh, Newton's theory, which has been accepted for centuries, is uh, falsified. That's, that's uh, um, important. So in other words, the background assumptions matter. What makes something bold is relative to the background assumptions. And again, uh, progress, not truth. That is, so you can have progress. That should be the goal of science. The goal of science is not to uh, get truth, to get truth about the world. It's to progress by surviving falsifiability. Now, so there are, uh, uh, this is a very um, valuable, there's a lot of very valuable insights that Popper has given us. And to this day, this idea of falsifiability is used as uh, a, a demarcation between science and pseudoscience. Uh, you know, astrology uh, is, um, uh, the thing about astrological predictions in the newspaper is they're always vague. The thing about uh, Nostradamus's predictions, they're very vague so that you can interpret practically anything as confirming it and it's practically impossible to disconfirm it. Um, but, but, there are problems with this view. And perhaps uh, a key one is this idea that uh, this still, even though um, Papa acknowledges that in some sense observations are theory laden, his theory relies on the possibility of making observations inconsistent with the theory that you're working on um, in somehow, it's somehow free of the, uh, of the theory that you're working on so that you can disconfirm the theory. But there are problems with, um, there, there are related problems with this. The first problem is that um, it's just a fact that sometimes you should hold on to the theory in the face of apparently uh, falsifying observations. In other words, if scientists had actually followed Popper's advice, they would have abandoned theories that later turned out to be very powerful, and we would have not made progress. So, for example, the Copernican uh, theory predict predicts that the relative size of, uh, is it Mars and Venus? Uh, should change throughout the year. But observation of the, um, the best observation possible at the time of Copernicus seemed to show that the size of the um, planets visible in the night sky did not change. So that appeared to uh, falsify Copernicus's theory. And Copernicus's theory was very radical and was actually uh, subject to a lot of very good criticisms. Uh, for example, the criticism, uh, the idea, a, a couple of criticisms were if we are moving through space, if the Earth is moving through space instead of stationary uh, at the center of the universe, as the uh, Ptolemaic view of the universe um, says, then uh, if you drop a, a ball off a mast or a high building, it should fall a good distance away from the base because by the in the time it takes to fall, the Earth has moved and it should be far away from the base. But when, you, when this happens, actually it falls straight down and lands at the base. So that appears to be a disconfirm, uh, a falsification of the Copernican view. 
And of course, these, uh, these observations appeared to show that the size of the planets did not appear to change in, uh, throughout the year. But the problem was, that's just because uh, it was inadequate observation. The best observation possible at the time was naked eye, and you just can't tell the, uh, that they were changing size. But the minute we got better observational tools, like Galileo's telescopes, then you could observe that the sizes did change. So, observations are fallible. Uh, the observation in the naked eye was in fact incorrect when it said, oh look, the sizes aren't changing. The other point relative to this is that uh, this is related to the Quine-Duem thesis to do with um, holism. Remember Quine's uh, suggestion that uh, you can't test a particular, this, he was talking about in theory, you can't test particular claims about the world um, independent of the entire language. The entire language which for Quine is embedded in our theory of the world which includes science um, is tested as a whole. And we can rearrange our, um, our web of belief to cope with apparent disconfirmations, not by rejecting any specific claim, but um, picking the minimal perturbation to our general theory that is possible. And I read to you in that Quine video a quote from Lakatos, which uh, is a great... Um, a great illustration of how uh, you can avoid an observation falsifying your theory. I'll read it to you again because it's one of my favorite examples. The story is about an imaginary case of planetary misbehavior. A physicist of pre-Einsteinian era takes Newton's mechanics and his laws of gravitation, the accepted initial conditions, and calculates with their help the path of a newly discovered small planet. But the planet deviates from the calculated path. So there's a case of an observation uh, so the theory, Newtonian theory, made a prediction about what would happen to this planet. The prediction fails. So we should falsify the theory. We should get rid of New Newtonian science. But it's not that simple because obviously there's other things you can do in response to this. You can say, does our Newtonian physicist consider that the deviation was forbidden by Newton's theory and therefore that once established it refutes the, uh, Newton's theory? No. He suggests that there must be a hitherto unknown planet, P star, uh, which perturbs the, pla uh, the path of P. And in fact, this is how Neptune was discovered, because predictions were made about how Uranus should behave, and it didn't. Uh, so really, if we were strictly following falsificationism, we should have abandoned the theory that made the predictions about Uranus. But no, what they did correctly was say, well, no, we're going to hang on to this theory because we think it's good. Uh, and there are alternative explanations of why the prediction goes wrong. And what Lakitosh illustrates beautifully is that there's an infinite number of alternate possibilities for each stage. You can say, OK, I say that there's a planet there. If there's a planet there, then it will have this effect. It doesn't have that effect. Does that mean you abandon the theory? No, because there could be a cloud of cosmic dust. Uh, obscuring our view, if there's a cloud of cosmic dust, blah, blah, blah this will happen and so on. Um, and you can just keep on testing pretty much um, uh, infinitely. So this means that falsifiability is more or less impossible. And actually, falsifiability pr faces the problem of induction. Because if you just, uh, the suggestion is that a single observation can falsify a general claim. But that's never what happens because you can say, well, I could have made a mistake. Uh, you know, if the law of, if um, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade could be falsified by an observation, then every time, uh, you know, pretty much every kid in uh, their first science class measures the, the um, boiling point of water as not 100 degrees centigrade. Why? Because they're doing it wrong, they have faulty equipment. Well, but if observations are these pure, unsullied thing, then we can't, we can't criticize them. We have to say, no, that's an observation, and it has this falsifying ability. But of course, we do criticize them, and we say, no, well, that's, 
you know, that, that, that could be wrong. In order to be falsified, the falsification has to be repeatable. How often? Well, an, enough to confirm the falsification. But notice that now you're confirming the falsification inductively. The number of instances of falsification matters, and if you have enough of them, then the falsification counts. But that's the problem of induction again. So the falsification doesn't avoid the problem of induction. The other major problem is that this view of science that is supposed to give a good picture of how we move is in fact wrong because it would, we, all of these theories would never have lasted five minutes. They would have been falsified. In fact, uh, and, uh, theories have to be built slowly and have to have chance to thrive before being cut down. They, they have to be held on to even though there are problems with them, and they have to be given a chance to maybe expand and draw in insights from other thinkers um, to show that they actually do survive these apparent falsifications. And there's a brilliant discussion of the Copernican revolution that does that. Which brings us to Kuhn, who started out as a physicist, then became a historian of science, and then published this landmark book that is probably one of the most influential books of the 20th century, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, and it presents this view of how science progresses that is like this. You have pre-science, which is where theories, um, as uh, an example of this that Kuhn gives is optics before Newton, where there are all of these scattered theories uh, that disagree. There's no uh, you know, there's no sort of dominant view. Then, out of this sort of competition, a sort of monopoly emerges. You can think of it as like, uh, you know, like the early days of computing. You have all of these different um, personal computer firms, and then one of them survives, like IBM, and, uh, and then everything IBM sets the standard and everybody follows what IBM does instead of having all of these competing uh, incompatible uh, models of operating systems and computer chips and so on. You just do what IBM does. And that's normal science. Normal science is when a certain set of uh, views about the world, theories, experiment, acceptable experimental uh, methods, it's, uh, that, it, it's what counts as science in that period is normal science. This uh, can last a long time. I mean, uh, Aristotelian science lasted for nearly two, uh, I think over two, well, nearly 2,000 years. Um, and then uh, it kept having problems. There were things that it predicted like, for example, um, it predicted, it said that all of the heavenly bodies were perfect spheres. And Galileo looked at the moon uh, and saw craters in it and said, well, the moon has big ass holes in it. It's not a perfect sphere. And then you get that hilarious example of ad hoc. So um, in the discussion of falsifiability, it said that you can't save a theory by making ad hoc additions to it. And an ad hoc addition is, a, is an addition to the theory just to make it survive falsification. And uh, the beautiful example of that is when a Ptolemaic, an Aristotelian, um, responded to Galileo's observation of these craters on the moon by saying, no, 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 it's still a perfect sphere. It's just that those craters are filled with invisible stuff. So really, the surface is perfectly spherical. It just looks dented because you can't see the invisible stuff. And Galileo sarcastically responded, OK, I, I, I believe in invisible stuff, but what you don't know is actually it's mountainous, so they're no longer s spherical. Um, pretty petty stuff. But uh, you reach a crisis when, the, uh, when you make enough progress in uh, scientific equipment so that it enables you to make observations that should confirm the theory, but in fact uh, uh, make problems for it. And then you have a revolution. And a revolution 
And he describes revolutions in very, uh, you might say, non-scientific terms, like a gestalt switch, like a religious conversion, like a political revolution. And a revolution is when accepted scientific practice is upended and replaced by a new model. Uh, and we see this in the Renaissance with Newton and uh, uh, replacing the Aristotelian view of the universe and the Ptolemaic view of, uh, uh, of the earth at the center of the universe to a heliocentric view and to uh, a rejection of this uh, hard distinction between the sublunary sphere where you've got these elements and then the, the fifth element outside of that. All of that was junked and we get a totally new picture of the universe. When that happens, when you get a scientific revolution, it's as if we're living in different worlds. Now, what Kuhn is doing here is he's acknowledging the theory-ladenness of observation in a big way. He's saying every theory tells you how to view the world, and you cannot view the world except through the theory. So there is no such thing as um, theory-free observation. So the observations that create a crisis are actually from the point of view of the theory. So it has to be pretty radical uh, to undermine the theory, um, which is why res revolutions don't happen more often. Because normally, if you see something that apparently contradicts the theory, you can make the, the kind of adjustments that Lakatos describes in that example of the, of the planetary motion. Um, but if, uh, if enough problems arise, then Finally, it leads to this revolution, and revolutions are sociological events. So once a revolution happens, it won't convert everybody. There will be the old guard. And there's a famous, um, famous quote that progress in academia happens one funeral at a time. The idea being that um, charismatic figures in, for example, science will have a huge effect on what counts as respectable science. So if, for example, uh, the logical positivists say that metaphysics is not respectable, that political philosophy is not respectable, then it doesn't get done until eventually they die off, they become old, and new guard comes through and rejects them, and suddenly, bing, you've got this complete change of view and you get flourishing of, as in philosophy, flourishing of political philosophy and so on that happened in the mid-20th century. Um, it's like a gestalt switch is another thing he says. You know, here's the famous duck rabbit. It's either a rabbit looking this way or a duck looking that way, but you can't see them both at once. One uh, view sees it as a duck, the other view sees it as a rabbit, and you can't see them both together. You, what you see it as is a, a direct result of what paradigm you're in. This phrase, paradigm sw shift, that is thrown around all the time, I think it comes from Kuhn directly, because he talks about scientific paradigms, which are sort of the assumptions built into normal science. Uh, and he says you can't really give a clear description of paradigms because it changes depending on what counts as normal science. But it, it spells out things like what's the, kind of, what's the kind of research that will get you funding? You know, research that is not funded will not happen. And if you're doing research that is regarded as crazy according to normal science, then you're not going to get funded. And, you know, that's one way that normal science survives because that's one case where it's not going to get tested by this radical new theory. Um, of course, normal science allows a theory time to develop. Para puzzle solving is governed by the rules of the paradigm. So this. This is a much better picture of science, uh, c much more compatible with the actual very slow progress of the Copernican revolution than the Popperian view, which would have killed off Copernican's theory in its infancy. Um, so, and he offers a better demarcation between science and pseudoscience than falsifiability, uh, because the, the problem with the, um, the demarcation between uh, falsifiability and not, is it's actually falsifiability is neither necessary um, nor sufficient. Uh, that is, a theory that appears to have been falsified 
shouldn't be necessarily be rejected, as we saw here. But um, it, you can have pseudoscience that is falsifiable. It might just make predictions that are hard to falsify. For example, it might, um, it might make predictions about the future. Like, uh, think of a, uh, all kinds of religious cults that say the second coming is, is happening, and they give you a very exact date, but it's many years in the future, and you can't falsify it now. So falsifiability is not necessarily a good dividing line between science and pseudoscience. Kuhn suggests a better one is, uh, uh, does the theory put you in a position to learn from predictive failures? Does it tell you what to do if your prediction doesn't work? Like uh, the example that Lakatosh gives of, you know, uh, new suggestions. Now, so Kuhn's view is incredibly radical. It really takes on board holism, this idea that the, that the theory as a whole confronts the world. And it says that we cannot get outside our theory. So it's, it's not as if we can say one theory is better than another. This appears to make it relativistic. It's like uh, cultural anthropologists' view of cultures. They don't say, well, that's a primitive culture and that's an advanced culture. They say, the, uh, you are showing your ignorance if you make those comparisons because you cannot judge any culture except by their own standards. Uh, and by their own standards, their culture is better than yours, unsurprisingly. And by your standards, your culture is better than theirs, but neither, neither is right. It's kind of like the view we have about etiquette. We know that certain things are rude in some cultures and they're allowed in others, which is the correct view. We say, well, there's no objective correct view. It's all relative to standards of etiquette. Kuhn is, appears to be saying the same thing about science. You know, what counts as good science depends on what paradigm you're part of. The effect of this is to say that we, we can't really say we've made progress because you can't say, Einsteinian theory is better than Newtonian theory because they don't work the same. They have different standards. They, they, they literally live in different worlds. So it appears to be anti-realistic. It doesn't say that there is a real world that we're getting at. It says, well, we can't get at the real world independently of the theory. So all we can talk about is, does the theory work? Does the theory hang together? Uh, and if it's cons internally consistent in a way that satisfies the people that are using it, that's all you can say. So how do you explain progress in Kuhnian terms? That is the challenge uh, for Kuhn. He had things to say about it, and uh, you know, Chalmers has, has some stuff to say about it, but certainly some, uh, some sociologists were happy to embrace the relativism and say, yeah, that's right, you, you literally can't make sense of progress. And uh, a, another philosopher of science, um, Feyerabend, Paul Feyerabend, really took this idea and ran with it and said, essentially, Einsteinian physics is not superior to voodoo. You cannot make that comparison. You can't say one is better than the other. There you are, a lightning sketch of some major developments in philosophy of science in the 20th century.